And yeah, my name is Wilson Mendes. I'm Google Developer Expert Web Technologies, and today I will talk about the list detail, list details page. There's a real scenario, as just I already explained before, like how we use the um, our components architecture, how we use atomic design and micro frontends in the real life. How was this migration from monolith to a page architecture itself? But yeah, first of all, yeah, that's me. Uh, I'm not that good with jokes, but I love pictures. So that's uh, for the time. What I would say is that, please guys, if you can just be together, I would just take a picture of you guys. You can go to Facebook and just... <laughs> and yeah, and three, two, one, do your best. I was recording anyway, but thanks. <laughs> But yeah, now let's start the game. Every great story starts with this phrase, once upon a time at domain, that's our case. Why we start with this idea to move from a monolith application, which was working, from another one working as a micro front-end application? First of all, Google. Google sometimes is not that great when you talk about things like S. EO, like it's, and he's not that benevolent when you don't follow his rules. What happens was we tried to do some auditions and take a look what was going on because we're paging was like, the ranking of page, you know, Google search was falling down, falling down, falling down, what's going on? And we found this. This, this is a tool for audition called Lighthouse. It has a lot of implementations of this. You can use it as a plugin, as a plugin in your Chrome browser or even as a CLI, just npm install it and use it. Feel free for that, please do it, it's a great one. And it creates for you some great reports. That report shows you progress web app apps, one to 100, what's your level, performance, accessibility, and best products. As you guys can see, we, have, we had at the initial state 10 in performance and 31 in best projects, which was the reason why Google was not loving us anymore. Yeah, let's just find out the reasons, right? Because we already have the reports, but let's do, just go in a deep level. As you can see here, we have a lot of components. Our application already was based on the components, but every component had to wait, had to wait for a specific API call. What's that mean? That means that if, for example, we have three calls for three different components, sometimes one of them can be okay, all of them can be take, sometimes just takes too long, and all, all, the third one just fails. Horrible death. What should you do? You can release this to the user. Let's fix that out. Another issue, mobile, in our first, you know, in our first application, we had a mobile website. What that means? That means that everything that you're doing for desktop, if you're releasing a new feature, you had to do the same for mobile. Different repos, code duplication. You can think about it. And that was our stack. A little bit of jQuery and JavaScript, a kind of mix. Sometimes we were using jQuery. It was the pain of the team. Um, and pretty much Microsoft architecture and stack. .NET, C Sharp, a little bit of BB, and so on and so forth. And that was our initial version. As I said, just a quick recap. It was a monolith. And all, some of the problems that we found during this process that the old code was highly coupled with everything like the same. There, there was no definition what was a HTTP call and what was a layer for presentation or a layer for a database. How can you manage that? It was totally like that. A mix of layers, as I said. So every time they had to look that code, you had that feeling. It was painful. And when it's painful, it's, you try to avoid do this. And try to avoid it more. And try to avoid it more. And that thing is just increasing, just increasing. How should it do? Because we're not playing the game in a proper way. 
Yeah, it's a great piece. So the first idea was the first idea of domain became from MVP. Okay, minimum valuable. We need to think of this because this will be the road for our journey. Let's think of MVP. MVP is not that is not bad, but we need to think. Okay, we are validated our business. That's great. So now let's do it, make it better. Let's do MVP version two. And two things that we need to keep in mind. First, do it. That's the main goal of MVP. Validate it. Second, do it right. You had it, did it, you had it validated, you can always improve because now you're really 100% sure that that thing works. And always do it better. It's, as you can see in the slides, it's there as a third option, but that's one thing that you always have to keep in mind. It doesn't matter if you're working as a company, if you're working in an open source project, really doesn't matter. That's a cycle. And let's make it better. Some things that we just added as a checklist because our main goal was solve those. So we need to make sure that those things at least were solved. First of all, as CEO, Google needs to love us again. Pretty much. Not only Google, but all the search engine engines. That code base should be easy to maintain. It's to improve, it's to evolve. That means a lot for all our teams. Think that before we had a monolith application, which means probably 10, 12, 12, 20 teams were working in the same code base. If we had to split it, we need to think that every single team should work the same code base. We need to share this ownership too. And it should be reusable because we need to use different place. That was one of the ideas that we came, as just said, with atomic design, for example. We have components that we can reuse everywhere. However, that's the good part that we are talking about. Let's think again. We were in a monolith. So what's your first idea? Any thoughts? You're right. <laughs> Just do it, right? Because that's a simple way in your top of your mind. But you need to think, the business you already validated. You already learned a lot of things with that code. You need to have empathy. That's the, good, the first step. And with those things, you need to keep in mind another point that probably people usually don't talk that much because it's, it's already old. It's not that new, right? We started this migration last year, a few months ago. And as you guys can see, we have some really, really bad points like individuals and interactions over process and toolings. So love people instead of love toolings and other things. Agile Manifest is there, we can read, it's that easily, you just Google it and find all the steps, all the bullet points. It's just some of them. In some companies you can find something like, should be SAP that we need to avoid all the time? After September, April May probably. With this in mind, with the first one in mind, not the second one, always good to remember ourselves. And we have some constraints. First of all, we need to remove mobile websites from our lives. It's not good for a lot of reasons. One of them is really hard to maintain. And we need to use, we need to do applications that should be reusable. So we found a lot of different approaches. The approach that we, that we realized that could be a good one for us was a component-based one. And should be web friendly, not, not only, because we're not talking about different, one application for mobile, one application for desktop, one application for tablet, should be totally friendly for any device. And now we know that in the real life, device means anything. This TV is a device, for example. And migrate, we need to migrate that. But we need to migrate page by page. We are talking about a monolith. How can you migrate that? Like, I just thought that the only, the only way to make it is just a big bang. So what are you talking about? It's not, it's not like that. And other question, if you think that that's the only way, can I use a microservice? Like, 
because micro people usually talk about that every time. If you go to Google, if you search something Google, you always will find this because it's a boom. Can I use microservices as a PWA application using React? Is that simple? Like, maybe that works, maybe not. Yeah. Why? First of all, we always think about names and sometimes we forgot about the ideas, architecture decisions, architecture patterns. Microservice is just abstraction for a micro way. What that means? When you think in micro, you think how easy it is to upgrade to application. It doesn't matter if your application is a front end, back end, or it runs in a TV. And with that, we came with that idea, with that name, a few years ago. And now we have microservice, uh, micro frameworks, pretty much micro whatever. Long time ago, we had a framework called AngularJS who said it's a framework, MV, whatever. And so on and so forth. And with that, we, we found an architecture called Micro Frontend, which is a really, really fancy name for something that we are using. Who here already heard about it? <laughs> Great. Now let's talk about it. Who here have heard about this guy, Strangle Pattern? Great, great. Who here heard about microservice? Everyone, talk two minutes ago. Come on. <laughs> but yeah, what I'm talking about those guys, because pretty much Strangle Pattern is one of the pillars from the microservice application. Strangle Pattern, sacrificial architecture, fancy names for things that I'll explain right now. Why not? So a real example will be what we did. Just to make sure, are you guys can hear me? Great. So as I said, the first application was a C sharp application. And we create a new page using our stack that we already, we already know right now. A node application with a front end using React and all the tools that we already have like FE build or renderizer and others. And what that means that we have a layer for load balance. So we have a route. Let's think a route like when you got goals. Every time you got goals, and there is no different calls here in Australia, at least not that I know, you go in a place, you try to pay, your, you try to buy your food, and they say, cash your card, cash your card, cash your card, cash your card, cash your card. It's always the same question, right? And you go to different queues, depending on that. That's our proxy, that's our reverse proxy. When you go to, when the user just open the browser and put domain.com.au slash, I wanna see that property and go to that proxy and says, hey, ah, but now you're looking for a listing, detail, a listing page. You look for a property. Instead of go to C sharp code, you just go direct to the node application. For the user, it's transparent. For us, it's totally, it's great, it's useful. We are not talking about C sharp code anymore. If we have to add new features, we just go directly to the node, to the node application. And we have a lot of other benefits such as performance and monitoring and so on and so forth. If you're going to other pages like home page or any other, just go straight to the C sharp code. Right? No big deal. Now everyone understands what micro, micro front end is, right? Cool. And let's go back to our checklist again. As I said before, the first, the first idea was, okay, we need to come up with innovation. With that, we came up with the idea of uh, application component based and should be web friendly. We already take all those options. And we came with list details page version one. As you guys can see, it's the same version that we had before. No updates in the UI, no updates in the user interaction or the user journey. We migrate. After that, okay. Look at that page. That page is good. Not bad, right? For the user, no difference. But do you remember that one of the first steps was that we had in the same page, to render that page, we had to do a lot of HTTP calls. So we had a lot of blocking calls. What that means, sometimes your page takes three seconds to load, sometimes your page takes 
13. You never know. It was not the case, I'm just doing some crazy scenarios. But yeah, we still have HTTP calls everywhere. We're doing all, all, them, all the HTTP calls that we need to make that page work. And we came with the idea. Okay, let's create an API. So instead of do all those calls, we create a single data source and that application just goes directly to that API, which does all the job. We already have everything stored. So now I'll explain a little bit of two microservices that we call aggregate API. First, the idea. We had the idea of create a single data source for that page. So every, every property that you go, it just goes straight to that API and have everything that you need. Second, should be stateless. I don't need to know anything about it. You know this, you're allowed to know about it. That's what I need to know. And that's it. So the API, that's the architecture of the API. So we have uh, just a message that we're passing. Let's think that this, this letter is uh, ATP call. When you go to the page, Internally, you're doing this ATP call or any other call. ATP is not the only one way to make it. But anyways, you do this call. You go to API, and that API reads the data straight away from the Redis. Why Redis? It's fast. And second, why not, right? I think that Redis in that case is just a past tense layer. So it doesn't matter if Redis, Postgres, or any other database can be SQL or not SQL can be anything. So we just have a persistence layer in that case that in our case is Redis. That's pretty much our aggregate API. Pretty dummy, right? Just read something and send something. Second point, we are not doing anything in that, in that case, right? We are just reading and send. If you don't have data, we are not sending anything. So there's no value in that. Now let's think of the second part of this, the whole integration. The second part we call as listing indexer. Like every property we call as a list and indexer is just index things. And which just adds data to the data source. How that works? Again, we, f we, we were thinking about it and like, okay, we have a lot of different approaches to do aggregate aggregate application, but let's think of something really, really dummy. Follow these rules and have everything you need. Why? Because an indexer is a Node.js plug and play task. What it means, before we were, we were doing eight calls. So now we have eight tasks. One task per each one, per each call. And if something change, it just reacts with that change. And that's it. If Index three weeks, we had a new ATP call and a new API that we had to consume. We just create a new indexer. Not only my team, and think that they, that API, the team was three people. Any team can have, as we said before, we have the ownership of the code. So anyone can just go straight away and read the docs, understand how that works, and just do it. So every indexer just is just listening to a queue, just waiting for a message. Hey, Will, are you there? Hey, Will, are you there? Yeah, I am. Okay, great. Let me give that to you. He writes in the Redis. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. So just plug and let it be. I just love that gift. I just love that gift. Plug, 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 plug. Yeah. You guys got the idea. An architectural picture, because we love pictures. So think that before we had that Redis and we have another application that read that Redis. Now we are writing that Redis. Every node task is just listening to a message queue. And when you receive a queue, can it be now, can it be 10 minutes later, can it be tomorrow? We never know and we don't need to. You're reading and writing, reading and writing. Okay, I have this data. Uh, now I need to update uh, a property in Piemont, and after that I need to 
update a property in Bondi. Okay, let me update, let me store that data and let just write in Redis. Right? So, the end, we have this architecture. This is just a mix of two APIs, like two microservices, I mean, sorry. Uh, the first one, the API who reads the Redis, and the second one, the, the tasks who writes in the Redis. With that, we solve a lot of issues, security issues too. Like, if, you, if you're not writing, you don't need to have permissions for that, and vice versa. And okay, beautiful, looks simple, right? But aggregate, indexer, we have some problems with that too. And one of them, because every task, we are running every task, every API integration as a brand new application. We need to think that every integration is a third party. As a third party, we need to think in all scenarios, happy path, unhappy path, and all the happy paths. Sometimes we never know. And how to control, which is the most important, how to control the idea of a sync word in an API, which is the core of domain. So think about it, go to that page, and I wanna see some update information about the suburbs. Like, now we don't have more five restaurants. Um, we have six, but it's not showing that. Why well, is not showing that now, but it's showing the, the next 10 minutes. That's one thing called eventual consistency. Who here knows about it? Is that a yes or no? Okay, I would say like maybe. Uh, if it took consistency, it like a run or even a racing. You're there, here in the picture you can see the first one with sunglasses, probably will win. But that's the picture that we have now. The run is not over yet. As you guys can see, there's one at the back that you can see the face. Sometimes in that picture you can see the face and probably the next 10 minutes, he just, he just the one, the number one. You never know. That's the thing. So that's a picture of that moment. You have a snapshot of that moment. It's not, you don't have the snapshot at the end. The same as a racing, as a Formula One, for example. And that's the beauty of eventual consistency. Because when you have this in mind, you can understand that things like that. Like, you go to the API, our aggregate API, and you just have the location information. Now, but 10 seconds later, you have the list information too. So, okay, now I have information about the property too. What it means? Mind blowing. Why? Let's recap. You have this information, and now you have a new information. What it means? That means that the first task ends, and the second task, it was Processing. That means that your application should be 100% resilient. And we have a lot of talks talking about resilient applications. One of the first companies who came with that idea was Netflix, with that name exactly. But we have a bunch of companies doing resilient application. If you have that information, if you don't have that information, if that API is there, if that API is not, what should you do? So our components, we, we learn how to make better components with this architecture too. So it's literally a mind blowing. Other point, I, I didn't talk about it in the beginning, but I love open source. Like I contributed several projects, Webpack, Omega Sage, Angular, React, a bunch of them, it doesn't matter now, now. But when we, contribute with them, you learn with them. And one of the things that we had, we were all, we was always, always trying to have in mind is that, okay, that's code, that code, everything should have ownership of that code. So if a new team member from a team in Melbourne had to add something, should be easier. So we are not writing, we are writing code following some good practice, clean code, I don't need to spend more than 20 seconds or 10 seconds to understand what that code does. That small piece of function, that pre-function is doing. Because 
if I read that, it's a book, or at least it's the, the most thing that I could do person close to the book. Apart from open source in ideas and mindsets, we have toolings. And those are some of the toolings that help us a lot. Like we made some decisions that for our application was those are decisions were great. First of all, Docker and use Alpine. Alpine is pretty much the smallest Unix system that we have now. It's based on an order that's even smaller, but doesn't have a lot of things. And called Busybox. So in Alpine, you have a package manage. You have everything that you have, for example, in a Debian with a big difference, which is a big deal. Alpine is 30 times smaller than a Debian image in Docker. Think that Docker is smaller and Alpine is 30 times smaller. That's a huge win. It means that if you have 10 tasks running, you pretty much don't even have a half of the gig. Probably you have 50 gigs or less than this. All the integrations, Nomad for auto scaling and Fabio for a proxy and console, console for uh, just a service discovery. Like if you had to add some informations in the meter, the middle of the day tomorrow, you have to change some, some of them. Just go in the console, change that, and that's it. Your application will understand that. You don't need to do any new deployment. You don't need to do a new fix. You don't need to do anything. Code total decoupling. Because we're using a, a standard. Console just implement a standard, just that pattern. Discover applications. And metrics everywhere. If you, after that, we Okay, we created this. We need to know what we need to improve and how we can, how we can know and why we should improve that metrics. It can, metrics can be a conversion. Like, okay, now that I added this button at the top, I have 10% less of the users renting that apartment. What's going on? Okay, it's not working. Just turn off, just roll back. Or even, okay, it's working really well. That's what it is. Let's keep flowing. It's good for the business. This is one of the metrics that we had. This specifically for the server, like garbage collection and how the API is working. And every single task is running at maximum <coughs> using 25% of the machine, which is pretty interesting. And that's a production application that we are talking about. And when you go to domain, as just a quick recap, when you go to domain, when you go to a page to look for apartment, you pretty much do a search and look the apartment. To look the apartment, we are using 25% of the whole thing. Every stack that we are running, every task we are running, we are running using 25%. Great, not that bad. All those steps to release early and release often. I'm not saying that. I'm just rephrasing what someone already said. All those things that if you wanted to ship something, they ship it. You don't need to think about like, oh, okay, I have a deployment process who need to take one week. I need to go this and this and this. Okay, you need to do some validations. Some business ones, you need to do a lot of validations. But if you wanna ship the code, if all those validations are already done, you don't need to wait too long. It should be faster. And like all the deployment takes us two minutes. And here we go. I was talking too much. Let me just show you how, guys how it's going. So that's the Listen Details version two. And every time that I saw that, I'm too excited. Uh, you guys can see we have a mobile version and we have a desktop version. Not big deal, uh, but a huge big deal. First of all, we don't have mobile website anymore. Second of all, we use the server side rendering, we are solving all the things. Third of all, we improved a lot the user journey. From the user to, f to look for apartment until rent or buy apartment. This whole journey is really, really straightforward right now. And Google loves us again. That's so great. And about our auditions, as I said in the one of the first slides, 
we were using uh, Lighthouse and that's our current score in Lighthouse. Pretty impressive, 91 of 100, but we always know that we have things to improve. But I, I can be excited, I should be. But I don't have the anyway. Uh, and next steps. We always talk about things, we always talk about things, but we need to think that it's a cycle. Okay, it's great. We need to improve this, we need to improve that, we need to add more features. Um, probably the business idea just changed. We need to be ready for reactions and be ready for changes. First of all, what if the API goes down? What if the API goes down? What if uh, a node application who is rendering our page goes down? So we, we are keeping that in mind. So the first step that we're working during those weeks is do a front-end application with zero downtime. Like if the page, if the server or if the API just goes down, we have a cached page so that we can serve the user. And at least the, main, the core features for that, for that page are available because we are just turning on the integration with all the APIs. So for the user, it will be fast. We need to think that when it goes down, it won't take too longer. Like sometimes it's 15 minutes, sometimes it's 30. But for the user, it will be transparent. That never happened. Second of all, we have a bunch of data. We have indexes that we never know. And we can use GraphQL for that because we don't need to receive all those things. Why we didn't use that before? Because, we're not, because it was not required. Pretty much the data that we have now for the property pages are heavily used. So there was no meaning. However, now we have scenarios like all the clients want to use the API. So they don't need the whole thing, the bunch chunk of data they need probably five objects or do a proper mapping. GraphQL will enable us to make this easier. And last but not least, just already said that in the beginning, but I will say that in the end, at the end, we are higher domain. So if you enjoy all those talks, if you enjoy this conversation, and I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed, just talk to me directly or that's my email or talk to me at Twitter. And thank you guys so much.